finished up last week the series of being the point of the arrow. We're starting a new series this week. It's called The Anchor Holds. And if you are familiar with the, any of the um, gospel music, Christian music and things, uh, a long time ago, a few years ago, for some of us, uh, there was a song that was sung, The Anchor Holds, and I hear that tune going over in my mind, and, and I love that song. I love to listen to the song. I love the words of the song. And so uh, we, we decided that what we would do is we would do a, a short series of messages on The Anchor Holds. And I, as I go about introducing this series of messages, I, I want us to, to gain from this to be able to know that we do have an anchor in Jesus Christ. He is the anchor that we can hang on to, that we can put out, and he will hold us in life. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, no matter the circumstances in which we live, the anchor holds as long as Jesus Christ is the anchor. Amen. So I'm hoping and praying that what we can do is through this series of messages uh, be, be able to come back to a place to where we find our foundation, to where we find and understand that Jesus Christ is our anchor. So we'll start off this morning. Uh, uh, the anchor holds Alpha and Omega. I want us to be able to take and, and to see and to understand and, and get this, this image of who Jesus Christ really is. Because really and truly, when we see Jesus, how many of us, when we look at Jesus, here's what we see. Uh, <laughs> anybody ever seen the, the movie, uh, uh, what, what, what was it, Talladega Nights or whatever it was, and it was, uh, I've only seen bits and pieces of it. I've not seen and watched the whole movie through, but I have seen the part where they sit and argue at the, at the table, and, and some of them like baby Jesus. And some of them like grown-up Jesus. And they sit at the table and they argue back and forth about which Jesus they like, baby Jesus or the grown-up Jesus. And I want to tell us and, and help us to try to understand Jesus is. And we'll understand that statement more and more as we go along here, but Jesus is. So many times when we talk about Jesus, some of the images that we get is Jesus in, in the manger. There's nothing wrong with that. It's beautiful. Uh, it, it gives us encouragement to, 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 to see and to realize and understand that, 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 this, that the creator of the world allowed himself to become a baby and lay in a manger that animals eat out of. Uh, that's an amazing story. Uh, it's an amazing story that this Savior would, would start a ministry and he would go uh, three years in his ministry and he would go about all over the, all over the place where he lived and, and he would tell people this new gospel message repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand it's an amazing story that we see a savior who would allow himself to be taken and allow himself to be strapped to a post or a concrete pillar or a rock or whatever it was that they used and they whipped him and tore his flesh from his body or to see him on a cross with nails stuck through his hands and through his feet and to understand that a spear was thrust into his side. We see that, and, and these are images that we get of Christ, but I want us to see and I want us to understand this Savior that we are talking about, this Jesus that we speak of, is not just some child in a manger, is not just some man who walks around saying good things and teaching good things, is not just some man who was hung on a cross, and not just some man who was resurrected, but a man who is God, who is over all of the universe. And one of these days, the eastern sky is going to split wide open. And we are going to see Jesus Christ, not Jesus the man. We are going to see Jesus Christ, God creator for who he really and truly is. We will see him in an image that we have never known before as far as what we get from what the Bible tells us. His image will be so great, his image will be so bright, the Bible says that whoever sees him at that particular time, they will automatically fall to their knees or to their face and they will cry out, he is king of kings and Lord of Lords. That is who we serve. 
And that, who, that is who the Savior we have. That's our Savior. And I want us to get the picture and to understand that this is, this is the Christ that we serve. This is who Jesus really and truly is. He is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end of all things. And we need to know that, we need to understand that in order for us to know that we can really and truly have an anchor that holds and an anchor that we can trust in. We need to know and to understand this is who we serve. Not some baby in a manger. Not even some man who hangs on a cross, although what he done for us there is so important. But that we serve a living Savior, a living King, a living Lord who is master over all of the universe. And he is the one who lives in us. Fathom that. Think about that. Contemplate that. That the one who done all of these things and the one who is lives in us. He is Alpha and Omega. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15, tells us and reminds us of this. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him, listen to the words, listen to what it says. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in all things hold and in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ, Alpha and Omega. John chapter one, starting at verse one, says this In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, drop down to verse 14. Listen to what it says. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, Father, full of grace and truth. And finally there, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8 says this. This is Jesus speaking. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Amen? He is, he was, he is, and is to come. That is our Savior. That is the Christ that we have. That's who we serve. That's, that is who lives inside of us. And brothers and sisters, if we have a Savior who created everything, if we have a Savior who is in everything, all things were made for him. And by him, if that is who it is that we serve, we need to remember and to understand that that is who lives in us. That same power lives in us. And we need to know that. And we need to grab hold of it. And we need to understand it. And we need to remember that no matter what it is that's going on in our life, we have an anchor that holds. It will not tear away. It will not break away. When we think of an anchor and we look at an anchor, remember the old days and we had an image of an anchor up here a while ago and that's probably the kind of the anchor we think of whenever we think of an anchor. Remember Popeye, the sailor? Remember his tattoos he had on his forearms? They were anchors, remember? You remember what he had on? The anchor holds. That's the anchor that we see. When we think of that anchor, we look at that anchor and we put it down and we, 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 we set it down. And what happens is, is the anchor is meant to hold the ship steady no matter what happens so that it will not drift away, so that it will not lose its course, so that it won't go off somewhere, so that it won't get bashed against the shore, that it will be able to stay where it is. And brothers and sisters, we have a Savior who is an anchor who keeps us stable who allows us to be in place no matter what the storm of life might bring. 
whatever might happen in life, we have an anchor that holds. I want us to look quickly this morning at three words I think that will help us. These are not unfamiliar words. These are words that are familiar to us, but maybe they are something that we see and something that helps us to understand that this is a part of what needs to be in us and for us to understand so that we can make sure that we know our anchor holds. First word, faith. We've got to have faith. You say, well, preacher, that's... that's that's obvious. That's an obvious thing. We talk about faith all the time, but brothers and sisters, I want to challenge us and I want to ask us the question, where is your faith this morning? And how is your faith this morning? Do you have faith this morning? And I want us to, I want us to really look at that and I really want us to try to understand what that word is and what it means. The, 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 the meaning to the word is to believe in strongly. To believe in strongly. And if I have faith, it means that I have full confidence in that I believe in, 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 in this, this thing that I believe for, our, for us in Christ. Do I really and truly believe that who I just described to you is who he really is and is he real and true in your life? Because he needs to be. He needs to be real and true in your life. Because I want to tell you, I'm just going to tell you from experience, if Jesus Christ is not the anchor in which it holds you, life is going to toss you to and fro. You're going to get bashed. You're going to, things are going to happen in your life. And you're going to ask questions like, why? You're going to ask questions like, this, how does this happen? You're not going to be able to know and to understand and to know that you've got someone that, that you can count on, someone that can be there when no one else is. Jesus Christ is. He will be with you through all things and in all things. And we need to know and to understand that he, he is the Savior in which that, that holds us, so we need to have faith in him. The Bible is all about faith. The Bible encourages us to have faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Romans chapter 1, drop down to verse uh, 16, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For, it, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Brothers and sisters, it's so important for us to know that we know that we know that we have faith in Christ, that he's going to be there and he's going to help us. Brothers and sisters, I know there are some things in life that we can go through and we sit and we wonder and we, we don't have answers for. As a pastor, sometimes I am asked questions that I do not have an answer for and I, uh, I want to know I wished I could. I wished I could say, I've got the answer for you there. But I don't sometimes. I do know who does have the answer. And I do know that I will trust in him. And I will live by his guidance and I will live by his direction. One day I will know fully as I am fully known. Till then, I'm going to have faith. I'm going to have faith in Jesus. I'm going to trust in him that he's going to be able to help me through thick and thin. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, 21 says this, For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, listen to the words, because here we go. Sometimes when we pray, and we claim we're praying in faith. We pray. And we pray. And we pray and we say nothing's going on. Nothing's happening. Listen to what Jesus says because words are important. Sometimes we leave some things out. So if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However... 
This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. In other words, it is not just something that we can just simply go, and it does it. It is meant that we are to put, give sincere thought to it. It's something that we have sincere commitment to. And that when we understand that we are working in the will of Christ, brothers and sisters, so many times we think of this and we say, well, just simply because I prayed for it, it's supposed to happen. Remember, Christ has a will. And things are going to happen according to his will. But when we are in his will, we pray according to his will. And when we're praying according to his will, it will be his will that guides and directs us in our prayer. Does that make sense? And then when we, when we allow ourselves to know and to say the, 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 the faith of a mustard seed, at that particular time, that was the smallest seed known to man. That's the reason why Jesus picked it. A mustard seed is so small, it looks like a grain of sand. And probably even some grains of sand are larger than a mustard seed. And to think that this single mustard seed can grow into this huge mustard tree. That's why Jesus used it. You see, our faith is meant to grow. If we plant it in as a mustard seed, it grows to be a mustard tree. And brothers and sisters, we're to have faith in Jesus Christ. So we must have faith. If we're going to know that our anchor holds, if we're going to know that whatever life brings, that our anchor is going to hold, we've got to have faith. The second word is hope. We've got to have hope. The song says there is a hope of a brighter day. Amen? There's a hope that we have. This hope is not meant to be something like we think of hope. This hope is not to be taken like we look at it and say, well, I hope it does or I hope it happens. But this hope is a, is a knowing but it gives us hope. In other words, it helps to give us joy. It helps to bring peace to us. To know this. To have hope is to trust in or be confident of. To have hope is to trust in or be confident of. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 3, says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Oh, there should have been some amens. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last times. We have a hope we want to go. We want to go be with him. We want to be with him where he is. Amen? One of these days, can you imagine, one of these days, to be able to open your eyes after having seen to go to sleep, to open your eyes, and then there to see Jesus. Welcome home. Welcome home. You've done good. You've lived life well. You've served. Welcome home. Brothers and sisters, that's hope. That's the hope that we have. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you that at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then drop down to verse 20, it says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Your faith and your hope is in God. Amen. 
We need to know that we have a confident trust. We can be confident in trusting in this Savior. That's our hope. He is our hope. He allows us to be able to experience Him. Not in the future. It's not a future thing. It is a now thing. Christ comes to live in you now, not someday. Christ isn't revealed to you someday. He's revealed to you now. And he wants you to experience him fully now. And brothers and sisters, we can. That's the hope that we have. We need to be able to know that we can trust and have full confidence in Jesus Christ. Amen? The last word is love. And how many times have we talked about love? Matter of fact, you, can't, I, you cannot read the Bible. You cannot read anything about the Bible that you don't come back to God's love. You want to know why you're saved? It's because God loves you. That's the only reason. Brothers and sisters, I fully believe God could have said at any time, I'm done, tired of it, I'm bored. They won't listen to me. <sighs> well, sisters, just as sure as he spoke this world in to existence, he could speak it out of existence if he wanted to. But he chooses not to. You know why? Because he has a love for us that we can't explain. He has a love for us that is so deep, so great, that he wants us to know he loves us. So it is so important that we understand his love for us to the best of our ability so that we know we've got an anchor that holds love. We know this, I'm sure most probably, almost everybody here has heard this at least once. The Greek word that is used is agape. It is a word that means unconditional love. It means no matter who you are, no matter the color of skin that you have, no matter your background in life, no matter what you were taught when you were young, no matter what you did last night, God has an unconditional love for you. And he wants you to know this unconditional love. He wants you to experience this unconditional love in your life. Love. Agape. To have such strong feelings for is not to put conditions on. My daughter ran off on me. I was going to call her up here. I love her. And I love our two sons. I can get frustrated with them. And I'm pretty sure they can get pretty frustrated with me sometimes. But my love for them, they don't even know. They can't grasp, they can't understand the love that I have for them. They, they can't grasp what it is that I want for them in their life. What I want for them to understand in their life. For those of us who have children, we know that and we understand. You can, you can understand where I'm coming from. And even more so now that I, I've got a granddaughter. And to watch her and to see how she works and to see how she develops and to see the things that she does. It's just a miracle to watch how you can say a word and she's trying her best to say the word almost exactly the way you said it. Trying her best. Because I might get frustrated or aggravated in or maybe even mad at. I 
My love for them doesn't change. I love them. Brothers and sisters, I think this is where we, where, where most people get hung up. When, when, tr when the Holy Spirit begins to draw someone to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, I, I think people get hung on the part where they can say something like, well, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus and I believe what Jesus did for me and, and things and stuff, but you, know, you just don't know me. You don't know who I am. You don't know what I've done. And, and, and I, I, don't, I, I just don't think God would love me, could, could love me. I don't think he would want someone like me. And that's not true. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood covered the sin of the world. Every single bit of it. Not just a piece of it. Not that he just picked pieces of it and said, I'll cover this, but not that. He covered the sin of the world. That means my sin was covered when his first blood of him, his, the first drop of blood that dropped from his body, it meant it was conquered, it was done, it was overcome. To be remembered no more. Brothers and sisters, we need to hear that and we know people who need to hear that so that they can understand that God does truly love them and God truly does care for them and God really does want them. And God really does want them to know that they can accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life and that that sin is covered and forgiven. It is so important for us to know that. It's so important for us to be able to accept that. The other part of that is time after time after time people will come to me and say well I know God can forgive but I really can't forgive myself. Stop it. That's a lie. As a matter of fact that's Satan's lie. When he has convinced you that you cannot forgive yourself, let me tell you what you have just done. You've heard me say this before. I will continue to say this. When you allow yourself to believe in that lie, what you have done is you have dethroned God and put yourself on his throne. What you have said is that God is not strong enough, not powerful enough, not creative enough to forgive me of my sin. I can't forgive myself. Listen to me. If the creator of the universe says you are forgiven, you are forgiven. You can't get on his throne. You're not good enough. Amen? None of us are. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us. That's why we cannot look and say, I've got an excuse. We don't have an excuse. There are no excuses. Jesus Christ died because he loves you. He stayed on the cross because he loved you. Not because of a nail, not because of a Roman soldier, not because of a Pharisee. Because he loves you, he stayed on that cross. And absolutely nothing can keep you from that. And absolutely nothing can keep you from the love of God. So we need to know and to understand and to remember. He loves us. Matthew chapter 27, starting at verse 37, Jesus said this. It's a, rem it's a reminder to us of the love that is in us and how we're supposed to use that love. And he said to, the, he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. With all that you are. 
But the second is like it. Love your neighbor the same way. Love your neighbor the same way. John chapter 3, verse 16. We know that to be something that is very, very familiar to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do we memorize that and just let the words flow past us sometimes? Because sometimes when we memorize things, we've memorized it to commit it to memory, but we say it sometimes in such a way that we don't allow it to sink in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever and that word means whoever. No exception. Whoever believes in him should not perish. In other words, the meaning to that is it should not go to a place called hell. That's what it means. Should not have to face eternal separation from God. Should not perish, but have eternal life a place where we can go and live with God and be with Him forever and ever. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the chapter that tells us and helps us to understand God's love. Paul starts off, and he starts off at verse 1. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men, of angels... But have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I gave away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not sit, insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Agape. As for the prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass, it, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the, perfect, when, when, the, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now I see in a mirror dimly, then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Love. Well, sisters, we have to have this love. We've got to try our best to understand the love that God has for us, and we've got to do the best we can to share the love that God has for us with others. Amen? These are the things that give us and are the things that we need to have in the anchor to understand about the anchor that will hold us in life. Always. The last part, verse 13, says, So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Brothers and sisters, 
We need to make sure that we have faith in Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we have hope in Jesus Christ. We need to make sure and we need to know the love of Jesus Christ in us. Amen. To help us to know and to understand the anchor holds. Christ will hold. Now here's the question for us this morning. Without, without any music going this morning, without anything going this morning, Are these things true and evident in your life? Faith, hope, love. Without these things being evident in our life, without these things being true in our life, how do we know that we can have confidence in the anchor? How do we know that that anchor will hold us and sustain us no matter what happens in life, no matter what comes? May I ask this morning, is Jesus Christ really and truly Lord and Savior of your life? Or is he just someone that you know about? Do you have a real, true relationship with him? Or is it just something that's just kind of, you know, I go to church. I'm going to tell you, going to church isn't going to save you. You can go to church from now on. Going to church is not going to get you to heaven. The Bible tells us that we have to accept Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. We have to admit that we're sinners. And we have to repent of those sins. And we want to ask him to come live inside of us. That he will guide us and direct us in our life every single day. If that is not something that is real and true in your life, I'm just going to be bold enough to tell you this morning, he's not Savior. He's not Lord. Because it takes us acknowledging that for it to be real and for it to be true in our life. If that's something that is not real and true in your life, would you make it so this morning? Would you ask Him to be Lord and Savior of your life? so that you can be attached to the anchor that holds. Maybe along the way, I got saved a long time ago. All right, you know, it happened when I was a teenager. It happened when I was a kid. I, I, all this time, I'm going along and I'm thinking, well, I'm saved, I'm saved. Can I just remind us that the Bible says that if we are truly saved, there's a reflection. That reflection is supposed to be Christ in us. And am I living for Christ? If he really and truly is Lord and Savior of my life, is he really and truly, I mean, is he, is he really guiding my life and directing my life? Because if he's not... I've, I've drifted somehow or another. I've allowed to, get to, to, to let loose of that anchor and to, to drift away. But here's what, here's what he wants you to know and to understand. He wants you to come back. He wants you to be attached. He, he wants you to know that you haven't gone so far away that you can't be reached. Maybe that's where someone might find themselves this morning. I'm not where I should be. 
and I know it. Remember the story of the prodigal son? The son didn't get so far away that he wasn't welcome back. Neither has any of us. The altars are open. And if someone wants to come and pray, maybe today it's not, you're not saying that the salvation experience is already mine, it's true, it's real in my life, but maybe there's someone on my heart I want to pray for. Maybe there's something else going on in life. Don't, don't think whenever the pastor says something about the salvation experience, everybody goes and runs, runs off and says, well, I thought they were already saved because Satan, Satan's going, well, you can't go up there because they're going to think that, right? Now, what the Lord wants is for you to talk with him and to be with him. And the Holy Spirit moves us and draws us to do just that. So is there anyone here today who would like to come and talk? Usually it just takes one person to say, yeah, and then somebody else will follow. Anyone today? Anyone to say, I just need to have a talk with the Lord this morning? Maybe I need to make Jesus Lord and Savior of my life. Maybe I've gotten away and I need to come home. Anyone? Then let me do this for us. If there is something you would like to share or talk about, my door is always open. You can call. You can just drop by. Friday, I had people drop by the office all day long. There was people in here from when we opened up to the time we left. And we encourage that. We want that. Don't be afraid to come and talk. Amen? Don't be afraid to pick up a phone and call about anything. Amen? Join me in prayer, if you would, please. Dear Heavenly Father, today we are so thankful we can be together. We're so thankful that we have this time. We're thankful that we can have this fellowship with each other. We're so thankful that we have a God, a Savior, who loves us. And so, Lord, help us. To, to have our uh, to strengthen our faith to have a hope and to have your love and help us to share this with others as we go out and be your hands and feet guide us and direct us in all that we do lord bring us back together this evening that we can once again come together as a church family we pray this in jesus christ's name amen